You're listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. We are sitting down for another episode of Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall, and this week I'm excited to introduce a new face yet again to this podcast. His name is Dr. Ron Horner, who is an apostolic teacher specializing in overturning verdicts from the courts of hell, local church government, freedom from captivity, and the court system of heaven in general. He's written a number of books, and the one that we're going to be zeroing in on today is called Overcoming Verdicts from the Courts of Hell, Releasing False Judgments. Uh, you can find him at courtsofheaven.info. Dr. Horner, it's a pleasure to have you on Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Good to be with you, Dan. Well, you know, I'm glad that you're joining me today. I am a proponent of the courts of heaven. This is something that we found to be very effective. I've used it in a number of situations and circumstances, and God has shown us some very cool and unique ways to use the courts. Uh, they've shown up during sessions with seers and people, you know, we've navigated them. One of the things that I am remiss about is that I haven't been able to do very many podcasts on the subject. So I'm so glad to have you here today. And I want to begin by letting you explain to us how you discovered the courts of heaven. Okay. I was in a seminar about five years ago, and the speaker said the phrase, courts of heaven. He didn't say anything else about it, but when he said that phrase, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me to study that. And so uh, I had been a pastor, associate pastor, things like that, over the course of my ministry. And uh, so this was kind of a new box for me. And uh, so I came home from that conference and decided I would just do a cursory search of how many times the courts of heaven, something related to the courts of heaven, was in scripture. The first time I looked, I found over 1,500 verses that had some kind of relationship to the courts of heaven. So I thought, well, that's pretty significant. So we can we can work with that. A few months later, I did a, another search. I added more words to it. You know, you think about justice, uh, judgment, different kinds of words. And that number went over to three, over 3,000 mark. Now, I don't know too many other subjects that have that many verses uh, pertaining to it. And even if only 10 or 20 percent of them, that is still extremely significant. So apparently it's a, a lot more important than we've known. Okay, so for you, it only started about five years ago. This is, this, this is not something you've been tracking with. Uh, for I had not. No, not at all. Not at all. Of course, not really anybody have been tracking with it for too many, too many years. Well, uh, amen. <laughs> at least know, not that I've met. You know, uh, uh, Robert Henderson had two or three CDs at the time that mm -hmm. I, when he spoke that. So, of course, he was the go-to guy. So he got his CDs and, he, you know, he grew from that. But uh, there weren't many other people to look at. Uh, Ian Clayton had a few videos on YouTube. And outside of that, at that point in time, there was nothing else to look at. So you had to get it from experience and from the word. So that's how you found out about the courts of heaven. How'd you find out about the courts of hell? We, uh, a friend of mine that I work with had been to India. Uh, and while she was there, uh, a lady came to the meetings that she was holding, and the lady, uh, she had decided that she didn't like a Christian husband, so she divorced him and married a Hindu. And uh, in, in that culture, when someone does that, the, the children, and she had two daughters who were of marrying age, those daughters are considered cursed. And she said, now this doesn't make sense. She's, she professes to be a Christian. Her husband was a Christian but she divorces him and marries a Hindu. Something is wrong with that picture. So she consulted the Lord about it, and that night she had a dream, and she heard the phrase you know, that he got a judgment out of the courts of hell. Mm. So uh, or that she had gotten that judgment, because anytime you get 
uh, what we don't often see is that there are judgments that are the underlying root to many of the situations we need to deal with. And so we can bind all we want to, but unless we deal with the root, we're still going to have that problem. Uh, just like in your counseling things that you do, you can deal with root or you can deal with fruit. If you deal with fruit, you're going to be dealing with it over and over again. So I'd rather deal with root. And uh, now how that came about with this woman, uh, she had decided that she wanted to divorce her husband. Uh, now, what Jesus said in Matthew 18, that it only takes two to make an agreement. So, uh, of course, Satan is going to agree that this would be a good idea that you marry this Hindu guy. And so she decided, well, I want to marry this guy because he's richer than the other guy. And so she made that, in essence, came into agreement with that. And that, that false verdict, and I refer to it as a false verdict because it wasn't originating from heaven. Uh, that was what was empowering her her marriage situation and was and was also what was locking down her daughters from being able to move forward in their life. Uh, the daughters that died in them were they were basically uh, castaways mm-hmm. of marrying age, but they nobody was going to touch them because look, they went through a divorce. We don't want our kid marrying marrying you and have to go through a divorce. So uh, when then she told me that story when she got back. And the Holy Spirit just began a download of information about false verdicts and how they're actually more prevalent than we've known in the Word and how they are what empowers much of what we're seeing that's negative, and especially in government. We can, we can look at that real quickly and say that didn't come from heaven. It had to come from hell. Fascinating. You know, I... I, I actually think my my journey with the courts of heaven may have started with things being told to me that i was firmly frustrated by later when i went back and considered some of the early reports of what people thought were courts of heaven when they began to describe them to me i think they may have been actually describing courts of hell that were cloaked in a veil of deception. Right. Because grave disappointments were being reported to me by, you know, going to courts and then receiving an accusation or different things and people thinking it was the father. And I said, something's wrong with that. Right. It didn't fit. At first, when I first started finding out about the courts of heaven, Dr. Horner, I will tell you, I didn't like it at all. Right. Um, but since I've begun to get some clarity and, and understanding that the evil realms have their own courts, a lot has begun to make sense to me. Right. Jesus himself is the one who told us about the courts of hell. Well, that's where I want to go next. What okay. can you tell us about the gates of Sheol? Okay. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, uh, he was speaking to Peter, and he said to the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, when we understand that it was at the gates, the city gates in the Old Testament, that uh, decisions were made, uh, land disputes were, were handled, even marriage disputes were taken care of at the city gates by the elders. Uh, then we understand that Jesus is not talking about some little picket fence in your front yard. He's talking a place where transactions, legal transactions were conducted. And so when Jesus says that there were gates of gates of hell, I believe he was referring to that they were these were the courts of hell where wicked counselors would get together and make determinations. And out of those determinations, nations and cities were affected. People's individuals were affected. Uh, the uh, Bible talks about different kinds of gates. Of course, you have the, the city gates and things, but it does talk about the gates of hell, the gates of Sheol, uh, Job talks about that. Uh, and it's from these places that these wicked judgments come forth that dictate behavior. Go ahead, continue. Now, uh, for example, I have, one of the books that I have is called Overturning the False Verdicts of Freemasonry. Hmm. And the approach is different than most of the books on Freemasonry, which deal with renouncing and repenting. 
But what we're not looking at is the fact that there were actually false verdicts that are empowering each of those levels of Freemasonry. And we have to get those overturned concerning our lives in order to get the real freedom that we're looking for from Freemasonry. I've known people that have gone through all kinds of Freemasonry prayers, never got set free. Uh, because again, they weren't dealing with the root. They were dealing with a fruit level situation. So, and Freemasonry is just one of the many things that you can say have false verdicts that are empowering the, the different degree levels or different levels of impact that people have in their lives. Uh, in government, uh, we have free, false verdicts come forth. The media is a proponent of false verdicts. They'll often pronounce something as if it's true when we know it's not true, hoping that if we say it long enough and loud enough, we will believe it. So that's a false verdict. They're trying to create uh, and establish a false verdict in, in the airways, in the nation, and in our society. Okay. I'm, a, I'm interested in the Freemasonry piece. Now, you, you mentioned something that I've heard a bunch of times as well. I, 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 I get this regularly. Dan right. Duvall, the only reason we're talking to you is because nothing else worked. First of all, I get that all the time. <laughs> right. Second of all, you know, so we get talking like, yeah, I've done a bunch of Freemasonry. I, I, I've said every Freemasonry prayer there is. So what you're saying, I've heard too. Now, explain to us what the difference is between the approach of the breaking a false verdict would be from doing a renunciation. Okay. Uh, uh, a false verdict is uh, just as in Mexico where you have cartels. They are the governing uh, force in that arena, in that particular part of the, their nation. Now, they're not the established government but they, they act as if they are, a, in essence, a rogue element, okay? So they may not have officially have laws on the books, but they have rules that you play by if you're going to live in that area and going to survive, okay? It was the same with ISIS. They had their own set of rules that you had to go by if you're going to live in that, that part of the country where they had taken over. Uh, and even though Satan... Uh, my understanding is Satan does not have a kingdom officially. It's not a recognized kingdom because Jesus said, all authority was given unto me uh, by the Father. So if he has all authority, there's not anything but anything left for anybody else to have a kingdom. But he, but he is, assumes that on us, and we accept that. But there's no post-resurrection scripture that talks about that that I'm aware of. Now, with that, if I'm dealing with a renunciation, I'm repenting and wanting it broken off my life, but I'm not actually dealing with the actual legal document that set it in place. By dealing with the false verdict, that is a, a legal document, even though it came out of the courts of hell, until it's overturned in the courts of heaven. Anything that arises from the courts of hell can be overturned in any of the courts of heaven, because the courts of heaven is a superior system. And so I want to get those false verdicts overturned in the courts of hell and replaced with a righteous verdict. Now, in the, uh, the other book that you, you, uh, that you have in your possession, Engage in the Mercy Court, I refer to dealing with, false, uh, false, with accusations that people are always dealing with. And I put it this way, accusations will affect your behavior, but false verdicts will dictate your behavior. So think about that and how that works in your life. Many times people are living under accusations, and if you deal with the accusations, and you know, Jesus said to agree with the adversary, confess it, repent, apply the blood, and, but that there's something still hanging on, on there, then you need to go a little a step further. And, okay, is there a false verdict that's empowering this thing that I need to get overturned? Mm. And, I can, and getting it overturned is simple. You know, now, as in anything that you're doing with prayer and intercession, uh, repentance is key. If uh, The more I'm willing to repent, the more impact the courts of heaven can have in my life. Uh, sometimes, uh, you and you had the same thing happen with you, you're dealing with somebody, but they don't want to own up to what they've done. They don't want to repent. They think the other guy's all at fault. 
and, I, and they're perfect. And so you really can't do a whole lot with some people who aren't repentant. But if they're willing to be repentant, then God can do a whole lot of things in their behalf. And so I'm, I have to understand that if I'm looking at a false verdict, then, I've, then somebody, something allowed it to come into play. And so I have to look at what allowed it to come into play. Uh, most of the time, Jesus said, uh, or the Word of God talks about how the judgment's going to begin at the house of God. So if I look, for example, if I'm looking at a governmental false verdict, I'll say, all right, what's the failure of the church in the same kind of arena? Because unless we deal with the failure of the church and our failure in our own lives, we don't have a moral authority to get the thing overturned. Mm -hmm. Jesus talked about in, Matt, in John 14 that he said, Satan has nothing in me. He is, I have nothing in common with him. Therefore, I'm able to do what I do. Uh, but if we have something in common with our enemy, we have no authority over him in that arena. You know, if you're dealing with somebody who has a pornography issue and they're trying to cast out a, a, a demon of adultery, it's not going to work too well. And, uh, and uh, they're going to wish they hadn't even tried because they don't have a moral authority with that one. But if I've got my life cleaned up, if I'm repentant, then I can have an authority over that thing and get the person set free without having to worry about anything happening to me in the process. Okay. Uh, and let me mention that. I don't have to fear repercussions and things like that if I operate according to the protocol of, of the courts of heaven. If I'll follow their rules, I'm free of that repercussion stuff. I haven't had to worry about that in years, okay? Which is a big deal if you're an intercessor because a lot of people, they're, they're even afraid to go into intercession because they've been whacked on so hard. And so if we learn the rules and obey the rules, we can expect to be able to do it without any problems. Well, Amen. Um, that's so interesting that you, 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 you mentioned, you know, what you did about the courts of heaven overturning evil documents. Right. That is such a key. That's exactly. a key that we've discovered. I, I, and I know uh, many times in deliverance and inner healing work that we do, I have a, a specific set of language that I use to shotgun this thing. Right. It sounds like this. I would say I pull up every hidden document, covenant, contract, agreement, certificate, oath, or vow. Right. Detailing the permissions allowing for whatever it is I'm addressing to exist or remain right. entangled. And then I'll say, I call them stamped with the blood of Jesus, nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and burned with holy consuming fire. Many times, just with that, it's an immediate, we're able to move past those documents. Right. And it's... Um, truly court language that, right. that statement it's just it is it works because it is courtroom language right and um i have found so many uh pieces of like the biggest breakthroughs that you know we get in the areas of you know deliverance and so forth the language is effective because it honors the legalities right and the mechanics of the courts right we've basically lived our lives ignorant of the fact that there is a court system in heaven. Mm. But we know about it from plenty of scripture. You've got, think about the first five books of our Old Testament are considered books of the law. We have the first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, which are stories of the Kings and the judgments that they would uh, issue as part of their kingship. We have Zechariah, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all loaded with court. Uh, related things. The first five, 50 books of, uh, of Psalms, if you look at those, most of those are David's responses in court, his defense of himself in court situations, the verdicts that he's requesting. For example, when he says, shatter the teeth of the wicked, he's in a court setting, and that's what he's requesting, that God would shatter the teeth of the wicked in that sitting, setting that he was dealing with. Uh, Job, we know, starts out with court case, two court cases. And Job, the rest of the book is Job trying to find out why, what he's in court for. And in Job's story, very simply was, he didn't show up for court. 
he was the one missing element in that court case. In Zechariah, we see that you had the same players plus Joshua the high priest. But we go to Job, we don't see Job in the picture. And in, in our nation, we have a thing called a default judgment. If I'm summoned to court and I don't show up for court, the judge is going to rule based on the evidence that he's get presented with. And if I don't show up for court, I can receive a default judgment against me simply because I didn't defend myself. And so we may say that's not fair. Well, you know, it's just the court system. Fair has nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, as we know in America, we have a legal system, not a justice system. And the courts of heaven is a justice system, but it has rules. It has some protocol, like with you, what you've said with all the, you bring up the contracts and things like that. You're talking the same kind of language. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm asking those things to be overturned or nullified or whatever the case happens to be, whichever it is, uh, and replaced with a righteous verdict. Mm. I don't want the law of the vacuum to come in where I've got something cleaned off. I've got the plate cleaned off or the table cleaned off and something else can come laying on top of it. I want it replaced with a righteous verdict. For example, uh, if the enemy is saying to somebody that you're, you will never be healed of this condition because it's been in your family tree, okay, we can get that as a false verdict overturned where healing becomes their possession, not only their possession, but they become ministers of healing to the future generations. And so that would be a righteous verdict overturning a, a false verdict. Any verdict that's coming out of hell is going to be a false verdict because he cannot tell the truth. I think the NIV refers to the fact that uh, when Satan speaks, he's speaking lies, which is his native language. So uh, makes sense to me. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit here, Dr. Horner. Okay. And uh, I'm going to be a little bit, um, a little bit difficult for the listener's sake. Okay. All right. Um, you brought up Job. I actually wasn't planning to go to Job. Okay. But since you went to Job, this, this is a, a, a major conflict and hurdle for a lot of people. First of all, there are the believers that say, oh, that's the story of my life. God decided that Satan should be able to trash everything in my life. And so he's turned the devil loose on me. And though you slay me, Lord, yet will I serve you. That's their whole philosophy. It's how right. the world works. Right. Mm -hmm. God's really not that good, at least not to them. But a lot of this gets anchored to the book of Job. Right. And, and you mentioned something and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, well, you know, but someone's going to be asking themselves this question. But Dr. Horner, if Job didn't show up in court and he didn't know he was being summoned to court, how is God being fair? And what if I'm the one that was summoned to court 50 times and every case I was summoned because I didn't know this existed, the devil won a court case against me, which may not be the right understanding of what you were saying at all. So now I'm going to turn you loose on the subject and I'm going to let you talk to the listeners, talk to people and just give us, you know, how you have reconciled some of these things. Okay. In John 14, Jesus said, uh, he was speaking to his disciples and he says, I want to pray to the Father and he's going to send you another comforter. That's what most translations say. Uh, some translations refer to it as an advocate. Well, an advocate in British, uh, in the British mindset is a courtroom, uh, uh, it's a court term. However, not in America. We don't think of an advocate so much like that. We, we think of comforter and we're thinking of a blanket a nice cozy blanket for the winter time. But the, the uh, translinear edition of the New Testament, the Aramaic translinear edition says, re refers to it as a defense attorney. So Jesus said, I'm gonna send you another defense attorney. Well, the language implies that Jesus himself has been the defense attorney while he was on the earth. Okay, well, we actually know that happened because when it talks about Peter, uh, Jesus said to Peter, Satan has, desire to sift you like wheat. The word desire there is, it's only used that particular way one time in that verse, and it means he has summoned you to court. And so Jesus said, I have gone in your behalf, and he got the ruling that Peter was gonna be able to come through that thing, and uh, when he was finished with it, he'd be able to strengthen his brothers. So 
now the Holy Spirit is our defense attorney on the earth. Okay. Uh, Jesus acts as a defense attorney in heaven. Some places refer to him as a mediator, which again, courtroom terminology. So uh, there have been times, for example, if I'm, if I'm sensed that I've been summoned to court, I need to make sure I show up. Okay. Uh, and there are times when we've actually had that happen in our past, not understanding the court system in its fullness, but we had a sense that we need to pray for something with an urgency. And so we need to respond to that urgency. So if I do, then I know I've got things that he's working with me in that situation. Now, no matter what happens in the court system, whether I showed up or not, he's able to take care of that judgment that came and get it replaced. We have the story of the widow woman in Luke 11, uh, where Jesus, uh, in Luke 18 rather, where he's teaching the parable on prayer. And he says that the, the judge was actually afraid that she was just going to continue coming every day if she had to until she got justice. So whenever we're in, dealing with the courts of heaven, we can always return and go back and get until we get the verdict that we need to get. Okay. Now, unless your verdict is completely screwy and some people have some, they have a, completely selfish motives in their stuff. Don't expect that to get answered. It's just not a good idea. You don't want that answer to come. <laughs> but things that are in line with the will of God, he's, he's willing to, he wants to bring his will in the earth. So he's willing to work with those situations. Uh, uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing some situations. Uh, like some of your listeners will go, they'll try to, to drill all the way to the bottom of that hole. Uh, I think you can get bogged down with that. And, you, and you'll end up missing what God's really trying to say about the whole deal. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Um, my next question is, can you explain judgments and the different types of judgments one finds in scripture? Well, I don't know how well I can describe that, but a judgment is an, an edict or a ruling that came from someone in authority. Now, oftentimes we have a judgment, uh, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 2, I think it is, uh, Ezekiel is allowed to see into a group of 25 men that were meeting, and he even knew who some of those people were. And it says, these are those who devised dark counsel for this city. So there was a group of people deciding what was going to happen in that city. Now, every, I live in the, in the South, I'm in North Carolina, and every small town has somebody who's actually calling the shots. They, know, they may not be in position of mayor or something like that, but they're the ones who really are dictating what happens in your city. Now, they are, in essence, if they're not godly people, then they're wicked counselors, which Psalm 2 talks about and several other places talks about it, wicked counselors. So, they are actually usurping the position that the church should take as the ecclesia to be the governing spiritual force in that city. So when the church awakens to the court's concepts and begins to stand in that role, they can begin to govern by the spirit the things that are going on in their city as opposed to these other guys who don't necessarily have godly means in mind. When there's a judgment coming uh, that, that has come out of the courts of hell doesn't line up with scripture, doesn't, is not beneficial to, to mankind as a whole, then God wants to see that thing overturned. But he needs us to enact that. The whole context of Matthew uh, 16, when Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, and whatever you bind will be bound, and whatever you loose will be loosed. Is he talking about handcuffs or ropes, or is he talking about binding agreements or loosing agreements. I think the context may actually tell you that he's really talking about legal documents that need to be either bound or released. Because a document is, is binding, is, uh, I'm bound to that document as long as I have have not met all the, the uh, requirements of that document. For example, if I get a car loan, that's a binding document. 
you know, we I asked people when in our in our meetings when they got born again, how many had a car payment before they got born again, and then how many still had the car payment after they got born again, and they say, well, yeah, me. Why is that? Because it was a binding document. You hadn't finished paying it off yet. Just because you got saved didn't mean everything got dissolved. Okay, so uh, which we kind of miss that point sometimes. It might be we might think it's nice to have the house paid off and the car paid off, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, but Jesus said, "Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed." We consider those documents that we're involved in as binding documents, and when we're when we've fill, fulfilled all the obligations, we're loosed from that document or from the requirements of that document. So that's a, another way of looking at, at Matthew Vert, the chapter that we've uh, often thought about it being handcuffs and stuff. You know, there's a lot of people that really struggle with the courts of heaven concept. I've met some of them. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 the truth is, there, there are some people, I, I call them fantasy tale or fairy tale Christians, fantasy world Christians. They believe Christians can't have a demon. Right. They believe the will of God is always done. They anchor it to a concept called the finished work, which there is a finished work, but their understanding is that this means everything's going exactly the way it's supposed to. And so they find it very offensive to suggest that there are actually evil judgments determining the things that go on in this world, which means, well, maybe we have some responsibility here. Right, well, in anything in life, you know, we never follow that through to see where it really logically takes us. Uh, you know, you wear, you have clothes, when they wear out, oh, I don't have to go out and buy any clothes because God will take care of me. <laughs> That's a little ridiculous. For me, I go down to Belk and buy some more shirts when I need them, you know. But like you said, some people think that every, if it's going to happen, we have a case of Ross Sarah mentality. Whatever will be, will be. That from that day, door door stay, uh, theme song from her TV show in the 60s, okay? Uh, understand that's not scripture. That's a song from Doris Day that she sang in the 1960s or something. Uh, don't build your life doctrine on some stupid song that you heard when you were a kid. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> we get locked up. We actually find ourselves believing with that. By saying that, some people actually remember that and remember humming along with that song. Well, they came in agreement with the concept of that thing. And they've actually come into agreement with whatever will be, will be. Nothing I can do will ever matter. But that kind of flies in the face of what Jesus instructed. He told us to occupy, or in essence, to disciple nations. They're not get, going to get discipled all by themselves. So we're going to have to do something. Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay, who's going to do that? Jesus is not going to come down and do it for us. We got to do some stuff ourselves. So they get to look at the scriptures that they're looking at, but they need to put them in, make sure they've got them in the context that they were written in. Many times we're taking the scriptures out of context and uh, trying to make it say something it never meant. I, I illustrate that by where Jesus, uh, where it says of Jesus, uh, Mary said to him, uh, whatever he says to you, do it, okay? Later on, there's a verse that says uh, that G Judas had committed suicide. So uh, go and do that likewise. Uh, you know, uh, it said Judas went out and hanged himself. Then another verse says, go and do that likewise. Are we going to put those together? I hope not, because mm -hmm. you would have a very short-lived cult if you did that, <laughs> uh, uh, because you're fulfilling your own uh, your belief system. But we often take the scripture out of its context and try to make it say something it never meant to say. It never would have meant to those to whom it was written. But we want to pigeonhole it and make it fit our belief system because we want our belief system to be our belief system, which is superior to everybody else's. And life's not that way. Uh, 
I tell people, if you want to be disillusioned, uh, find yourself, find out what illusion you've been living under. Because if you're disillusioned, you've been living under an illusion. Mm-hmm. So, so examine yourself. What's the illusion I lived under? I mean, this is a, this is real life, right? Uh, one of the problems that I have, you know, Dr. Horner, is that there are far too many believers to be having such little impact on the direction of nations in the right. earth right now. There's just far too many. And, and, and how does this make sense in any set of realities? Uh, answer. Most of the people that consider themselves Christians are deceived and not actually walking in what God has provided for us. Right. Uh, our eschatology is part of our problem. Which, <laughs> well, I would agree with that too. Because if we're, if we're getting out of here next week, what, what, why bother? And Come that's on. what that's what we've essentially told ourselves. Oh uh, my gosh! Jesus, uh, well, Peter, the first sermon said, "We're awaiting the restoration of all things." Yep. Uh, I don't know about you. Now I live in a not a it's not an ugly town, not a bad town, but it doesn't look like heaven. And we're supposed to be making this place reflect heaven. We got a ways to go. So I'm not looking for Jesus next week, not next month, not even next year. Probably not in my lifetime because from what I see, we're not very restored yet. But we can be if we'll begin to exercise and get in league with what he's saying. Uh, And the courts of heaven is one of the ways that we can get that accelerated. Uh, Things that we have dealt with uh, and taken years to deal with can I've seen overturned in a day or in four days or in five days. You know, lifetime things, people have been praying over for 25 years and never changed. But all of a sudden, in four or five days, everything has shifted for them. Sometimes as much as uh, one pastor friend of mine, uh, he began to pray over some things concerning his church. And by that afternoon, he was getting phone calls of answers to those prayers that wow. he, he dealt with with the courts. He said he'd been doing it the other way. Nothing changed. Nothing moved. But he went through the courts, dealt with some issues on it, and he got phone calls literally two or three hours later over several situations that had shifted that quickly. So I like the, the suddenly aspect of that. Okay. I love it. Now, I want to have you talk about indicators. What are indicators of false judgments at work? Okay. In the back of the book, I've got a whole series of things that, for example, when the, I mentioned it earlier, when the media touts something as true, but it's obviously not true, that's a false judgment. Uh, mm-hmm. Joseph Mengele, who was Hitler's propaganda minister, he said that if I can say something loud enough and long enough, they will eventually believe me. Okay, so think okay. about that. The, it worked quite well in Germany. He was quite effective with that. And the same pattern is being repeated today in our society because the media, as a rule, has no respect. Like they, they've never had the, the utmost of respect for some things, but they have less now than they've ever had. And so they present things as if they're true, not without ever having the intention of bringing forth truth. And there's a vast difference between what they present as true and what is actually truth. Uh, When you're in a vortex of behavior for which you don't seem to be able to come out, you're probably dealing with a false verdict. For example, people that are caught into heroin addiction or something like that, some kind of addiction system, uh, and they are not able to get free, there's a false verdict still keeping keeping them locked down to that situation. If you receive a verdict, a prognosis, a medical diagnosis that is viewed as terminal, that would be a false verdict because the word of God says that I'm the God that healeth thee. First Peter 2.24, that by his stripes we were healed. Healing has been provided. If he had not wanted us healed, he would not have provided a healer. But he did that through the blood of Jesus. So those are a couple of things that you can look at. And we see that a lot, particularly when people hear the big C. They get a diagnosis from the doctor 
and it becomes a death sentence to them. That's because that false verdict is empowered and the words behind it are empowered through false verdicts to say, I'm gonna bring forth death in that situation. We can get that thing overturned, replaced with a righteous verdict that says you, you will live and not die, you will declare the works of the Lord. And I like that a lot better than the, the first thing, okay? So what about, uh, so, so I like the way you say this cycle of negativity or vortex of it. You know, one of the things that oftentimes Christians run into are barriers to progress. As if to say they hit the same barrier every time they begin to progress. Right. For instance, every time I try to start a new entrepreneurial exploit, someone steals from me and it crashes the exploit. Right. Would you say that this is also tied to the false judgment issue? And, and in this case, right, let's talk about the business. The entrepreneur, say every time I try to set my hand to something, you know, within two years, someone steals from me. And it's always someone different. Mm -hmm. you know? But nevertheless, it keeps happening. How would you walk them through practically okay. some freedom? <clears throat> Now, in, in Psalm 7, David was asking the same kind of question. And one of the, in one verse he says, what is this judgment that I'm enjoined to? Mm. He had realized that there was a false verdict, not against his life, but against a previous generation that was still in play because it had not been canceled or not been overturned. Now, see, as far as the enemy is concerned, uh, a legal agreement made with your ancestors 500 years ago is still in play because you're one of the, you're his seed is still being existing on the planet. So, and, and you deal with that with a lot of the stuff that you work with, but those, the enemy considers those legal agreements uh, uh, in perpetuity. They never end as far as he's concerned and they won't ever end unless somebody stops it. Okay. Now, in Isaiah, he says, I haven't stolen, but I must repay. Okay, the same concept is a work. There was a false verdict or an, an iniquity created something in their generations that is plaguing them today. Now, some people say, oh, I don't believe what we have to do with generational stuff. Well, you can believe that all you want to, but it still doesn't mean you're free. Because some, I'll look at your life, I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, the old saying, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. Okay. It's the same way with, with those things. Uh, somebody, I've had people say, oh, I don't believe in those things. Well, you don't have to believe in them. It doesn't mean it's not true. Your belief system, it's not going to fall, rise or fall based on what you personally believe. Uh, uh, there's enough evidence that it's still in play somehow. Uh, that we need to get a thing dealt with and get it shut down. Chances are you are dealing with a false verdict and it may not be nothing related to you. It could have been something that your grandpa set in motion that we need to get dealt with. Now, the nice thing is we can get it dealt with and it frees up everybody, but ignorance is not bliss. And some people want to ignore the, uh, some things. I don't know about you, but I'm, not all my ancestors went to Sunday school. <laughs> they weren't all nice people. And so I can recognize that in my ancestry, somebody did something wrong. They may have murdered somebody, may have pillaged a village, may have raped somebody, may have stolen, things like that. Everybody in their ancestry has that. We're not so perfect that, that it's not there. Uh, and if we're of, and all ancestries, had some form of Baal worship or sun worship and moon worship. So we have to recognize we all have a common denominator. If you're Hispanic, you know you're looking at the Inca, Mayan, or Aztec, or something similar. Uh, if you're from Africa, the continent of Africa, you're looking at the very same thing, just different labels. If you're from the European continents, you're looking at the same thing, different labels. We all have the common problem we worship the sun, we worship the moon, we tried to appease gods, we tried to make deals with demons, and it didn't work out too well. And we're still having to pay the price. We're just too sophisticated to call it demons now. We call it something else. 
So this person comes to you and they say, all right, I keep getting robbed, can never make progress in my entrepreneurial efforts. What do you do? You help them to understand, look, you have a false verdict. They understand. Okay. What's next? All right. We look up, we look to see uh, if there's something they've left undone. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they've covered their bases and are, are clear in essence, let's look in the family tree just a little bit. We don't have to shake the family tree too far. Usually to find somewhere along the way that they did something similar or created that pro hardship in somebody else's life because you have the adage that the seed you sow is the seed you grow. Okay. It's going to, uh, everything will reproduce after its own kind, good or evil. Okay. So if I've got that in, in that case, then I want to do some repenting, releasing, and getting that thing covered so that there is no legal reason for the enemy to, to withhold that from me. The answers, the reason our prayers are not answered, there's a legal reason keeping it from being answered. So that's why I deal with the courts of heaven. I understand that heaven, uh, the, the spirit arena works on a legal system and it has rules. Those rules will work for me or they can work against me if I don't utilize them properly, if I don't do what I need to do. But if I'll cover my bases and utilize the blood of Jesus to cover my sins, things like that, then I can live free from those hindrances and bondages. Now, does that mean everything about my life is perfect? No, but it's my, I'm making good progress, you know? And when I, something comes up, I see I need to deal with that thing. Okay, let's deal with that thing. Any good defense attorney does not bring all the dirt that he has on you. He will only bring out what he needs to to win that particular case. Assume that the enemy, Satan, uh, as going against you in the courts of heaven, would do the same kind of thing. He would hold until it was the opportune moment to try to take you down with that particular thing. That's why we want to deal with our stuff. Uh, be repentant. Uh, when we get that thing overturned, freedom can begin to be released to that person. Many times it's like the, the dam that's had the lock closed on it, and we just simply need to unlock the thing so the water can flow, the provision can come. Now, one of the things that I've, I've, I've been asked this, because it's a lot easier to navigate the courts of heaven with a seer, because they can actually see many times what's right. happening, right? You're like, okay, I pray that the accuser in this specific situation would be summoned into the courts. And like, you know, Joe Schmo says that, whatever, nothing happens. They don't see, they don't hear. They're like, this isn't really doing much for me. The seer, on the other hand, actually, oh, wow, look at all of these people showing up in the courtroom. Oh, right. Several voices of, and, and so you have different people that have different experiences with this prayer technique. And, and some folks are, are very discouraged. They're like, I can't use the courts because I'm not a seer, therefore I am disqualified from using the courts. Uh, how do you counsel, because I know, I know what I usually tell people, but how, how do you counsel people that come to you in this way? Okay. Well, the good news about the courts of heaven is it has a help desk. And I have a, a small book on that called Engaging the Help Desk of the Courts of Heaven. Oh, wow. Because when you need help, all you have to do is step to the, into the, the help desk. And again, you're listening. If you're not seeing stuff, you still have a knower. And you can hear and have impressions that come from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I understand that the Holy Spirit is always going to guide you into truth. He's not going to be condemning. The, he's always going to be trying to bless you and edify your life. So I can simply request, I need help knowing where to go, what to do, how to get this taken care of. Now, I describe in that book, uh, if you can imagine a large mall that has an information desk, Courts of Heaven Complex is not unlike that, where I can step up to that information desk and say, this is my situation, can someone help me? And an angel will actually come over and escort you to where you need to go. Now, I always tell people, as you're, when they walk up to a door, take a look above the door and see what the name of the court is that you're going to because it could be not what you're expecting. And common sense will help you 
walk through that. Uh, you can always ask questions. Remember, Jesus said that when we come to the kingdom, we come as a little child. And a little kid's going to ask questions all the time. I have a nine-year-old grandson. Does he ask questions? Regularly. Because he wants to figure it out. So we can do the same thing. We can always ask questions and then follow the impressions that we get. Yeah, it's nice to have a seer, but you don't always have that benefit. But also understand that just because you're not visually seeing doesn't mean you're not seeing. Because many times people are operating what I refer to as uh, by sonar. Mm. Uh, you know, if you were a submarine, video camera wouldn't do you a lot of good. But you can, by sonar, you can just have a knowing of what you're dealing with. And even, for example, if it was the angelic, you could know that there's an angel in the room over to your right, off your right shoulder, and that he's been watching you and has had his, had, had his hand on your desk, your executive chair there, the whole time that you've been doing this, because you have an entourage of angels that work with you, Dan. Okay? So as that's going on, I don't have to see them. I can just know. And I can pay attention to my knower and work with my knower because he's guiding me in all truth. I have every expectation that when I step into the courts of heaven that he's going to guide me into truth. And I have no expectation of having to contend with some demon or something like that. I don't have to go there at all. And I don't have to go in with any kind of fear about that because Jesus and Matthew said that if we're ask our father, for a bread, he's going to give good things to those who ask him. So I can have that expectation of my father. Okay. So now, like anybody else, it's nice to have us here, but it's not a requirement. We can work past that once we understand a few of the principles. Now, as the author of a number of books on the courts of heaven, uh, I have to ask a question. Are you a prolific seer? Or are you more on the side of the sonar? Uh, it's been more sonar than the visual. However, the visual is kicking in. Mm. Now, and what I notice with that, and this is what I teach people, uh, the interesting thing about what I do, I can actually help kick in the seer part on somebody by working with them, and I'll draw it out of them. And we have people, for example, uh, this week we, I do, I work with people in court cases over Zoom uh, on a regular basis. And in one setting, from the beginning of the, the meeting till two hours later, uh, by the end of the two hours, they were doing all the seeing. We didn't have to do anything, but just listen. Uh, and this was a husband and wife situation. They had not been seeing, and, but now they can see, and they were describing, and they were doing a great job with it. Uh, once I understand that, Sonar is still seen. It's just not visual. Okay, that takes the pressure off people because we're always thinking, oh, I've got to see you just as prolifically as so and so. No, you don't. You can just operate with what you've got and it'll improve as you go through it. Uh, I know people that uh, I have a good friend that I work with a lot. She can, uh, when she sees a book, one of the books, she can read the book as if we're sitting here as if you were sitting there reading a magazine. That's how prolific she can see. Uh, I want to tap into that. I want, get, <laughs> I want to get better and better on this thing. But I want to work with what I've got. If it comes in a series of snapshots or just little brief images, I'm going to take those and build on that. And that's what you can do. Just, just build on what you do have. You know, I, we actually have a lot of similarities here, Dr. Horner, as you're describing the way you flow, um, picking out a similar thing as to the way I flow, because some people, you know, they've, they've listened to me talk or hear podcasts, and tell stories. They think I'm this incredible seer. Like I just live in the spirit world and just like zoom around on a magic carpet. I don't. I'm like a normal person. I wake up in 3D world. I go to sleep in 3D world. But I have a knower that probably works better than my seeing gift in ministry. And, and, and it depends because if I'm receiving ministry, it's funny. I might see better to be on the receiving end of ministry than on the ministering side. Right. And you know, there's all these little nuances, but 
my thing is I'm very comfortable with Holy Spirit. He's my friend. So I just relax with it. And I think a lot of people struggle with even considering Holy Spirit their friend. That That is a bridge they haven't crossed yet. And so there's a lot of false expectation they go into things with and they get discouraged quickly. So I appreciate what you've said. Right. One of the things uh, that we work with when we do our seminars is we teach people how to step into the realms of heaven. Okay. It's so much easier than we've made it. Uh, we've all we've all been taught to put heaven off until we die. Mm. Okay. But we don't have to do that. Come and, on. I, and I describe it this way. I said, if you're a citizen of, uh, we are what, Richardson, Texas, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. You know where the police station is. Yeah. right you know where the town hall is you know where the library is things like that okay so i can assume if you're a citizen of that area then you know something about the place but if i ask most christians what could they describe anything about heaven they draw a blank okay something's wrong I will, i'm going to check your i'm going to be wondering about your citizenship if you don't know anything about the place okay but in, Jesus, in Matthew 3, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, one aspect of that was the kingdom of heaven is as close as your hand. Okay? Because when Jesus was baptized, it says he came up out of the water, and immediately the heavens were open, and he saw and he heard. They saw a dove, and they heard a voice. So when the heavens are open over your life, you can see and you can hear. Okay. Now we live under open heavens because Jesus initiated that that day in the Jordan River. And so we can, everything we do as a believer, we do by faith. So we can very simply just take a step into the realms of heaven. Now when I'm demonstrating this and showing them how to do it, I'll have them stand up and just simply take a step forward and imagine that they're stepping from one place into another place. In my living room, I have hardwood floors. Then I have a carpet in front of the sofa. So I'll have them stand on the carpet or on the wood floors and say, now you're going to take a step. And when you do, you're going to step into the realm of heaven and they'll step onto the carpet. And that helps kick in that faith to experience that. And they'll begin to see and hear things and uh, hear sounds, things like that. And when you do that, when we become familiar with heaven from that aspect, it makes it so much easier to navigate in the courts of heaven because it's all in the realm of heaven. But we can all do that just simply by just taking, saying, I, Father, I choose to take a step in the realms of heaven right now. And by faith, I just step in. And we can become cognizant of that. And as you do that, you become cognizant of what heaven is and what's going on in heaven. And we can live with a, that awareness all the time. And so people are amazed at just how easy it is because they've tried to work it up. And working it up just frustrates you. All I have to do is just take a step. You know, I could have you stand up, take a step, and you'd be there. It's, it's, it's amazing. People are amazed at how simple and how life-changing that becomes. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a young lady in a meeting I was at, and she, uh, we stepped her in. The first person that met her wasn't Jesus. This time it was her dad. Now, the reason that's a big deal, which I did not know at the time, was that 17 years before, her father had committed suicide. And she had been wondering for 17 years, where was he? Did he make it to heaven? And so the very first person that, it, that meets her and embraces her when she steps in is who? But dad. That answered a lot of questions and set that girl free from a lot of condemnation because every all these Christians are saying, oh, your dad, he went to hell because he committed suicide. Yeah, that's what uh, they say. You know, but consider if you committed suicide, you're not in your right mind. Something is, you're just too, too distressed over something. I see the mercy of God kicking in to cover our stupid, you know, cover our mistakes, things like that. So I, I can be good with that. And I th the, the healing that occurred in her life because of that one thing, it was just a, a lot of fun to watch, huh. you know, because you could see from one minute to 10 minutes later how much different she was, how much healing that brought to her. Because you think about it, you've lived half your life not knowing where dad is. But the last thing she remembers was 
saying to him, I love you, Daddy, as he left church. Because she went one way, he went another. And that afternoon, he committed suicide. So heaven is good about that kind of thing. It just answers all kinds of questions for people. When they can step in like that and experience what heaven is really like. You know, and that's so good. And I just have to keep reiterating this uh, to people because, you know, some some Christians can only ever see the evil side of things. Right. Sounds like necromancy. No, it's called the cloud of witnesses. And <laughs> the first guy that I heard talking about the cloud of witnesses in this way uh, was a friend of mine. Uh, he he actually came on the podcast and shared some some stuff about this with Daryl. Crawford Marshall and, and 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 he he was telling me how the Lord had started doing this thing and this was a few years ago but where he would just be talking with someone and all of a sudden he'd be in heaven right. he'd be in the cloud of witnesses and he'd be engaging with someone that knew that person right. but was in heaven and they'd tell the, him his spirit and he'd get the download while he's talking to them in the physical and just say hey you know uh this and this and such and such and I mean people would just break right and it's this, this engagement, a cloud of witnesses is so real. And that, that is one of the things that we found, even in some of the court things that we've done, is that people's ancestors in heaven are being made right. Sometimes it's like, it's like they're being made right by the redemption to the bloodline that's being transacted and the uh, remunerations that are being granted for what's been stolen at times. It's, it's really, so they'll be there like, cheering it on like yes thank you you know mm -hmm. yeah the uh, i had a friend going through the uh, freemasonry book when she got mm -hmm. to the 27th level she said all of a sudden i heard my ancestors saying thank you we're so sorry we did not know what we were doing and she was not expecting that at all but it just uh just kind of definitely caught her off guard because right? they really didn't know what they were doing and now they realize it. This is not Sunday school literature, Dr. Horner. No, we've missed that. Uh, part of our challenge on that was uh, that as Protestants, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They had no understanding or regard for the fact that uh, some of these guys actually had some things that they could actually teach us if we'd listen. And so these, uh, the uh, patriarchs, they're still doing things, and they still have deposits to make in the earth, but they haven't been able to make those deposits because we, they haven't had a landing place for it. But if I create a landing place for that information, I can benefit, and so can the body of Christ. Okay? We've all heard of people who had visitation from Paul or Peter or Jesus and things like that. If Jesus had no problem talking to guys on the Mount of Transfiguration, so what's our excuse? You know, he kind of broke it open for us. <laughs> what are some of the other notable testimonies that you can encourage us with, that, 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 you know, re regarding courts of heaven work? Okay. One of most, my most fun ones is a, a young man named Ben. He had been wrapped up in the drug scene and was in all kinds of mess. And his mom, uh, came to was at a seminar and so we did some court work with her in in behalf of her son and as she released some things uh, she was able to forgive him for some things and forgive her ex-husband things like that and in a matter of just a short time after that she gets uh, her son came to church one day i don't think that she even knew he was coming he came into church, walked down to the front, got born again, received the baptism, et cetera, has been full on for God uh, since that time. And it's just an amazing testimony of how free, how God rescued him from his, that situation. In the petition, she requested that the, God would separate him from the, the friendships that were not beneficial. You know, he had three friends that were very instrumental in his life getting him into that stuff one of them was killed another was run out of town because of something in the drug trade and something happened to the other guy 
well, those things would get your attention if you're caught up in all that and all of a sudden your friends are getting whacked or something. So it got his attention and that's what helped uh, brought him into that situation. And another one, there was a young lady who had gone through a bad divorce and was having trouble in her second marriage. They'd already separated and only been married a couple of months. Uh, she was just in a bad state of mind. She was not able to make a sound decision for herself. And so her uh, ex-husband contacted me about this situation. And so we went to the courts of heaven in her behalf. We collected different accusations and things like that. And when we finished our court work with her, uh, about four or five days later, I get a phone call. They had reconciled. She had quit the job that she was in that was in a bar. Uh, she had enrolled in college. And all this within about four to five days time. He said, I don't know what's happened, but she's back. Mm -hmm. Meaning the girl that he had married, he could, he was actually talking to her now, not something else that had been going on in her life. So she, that got turned around in a matter of just a few days. Another situation, uh, a lady that we worked with, her daughter had been involved in something for three years. They'd been praying for three years over the situation. We did some tough in the courts. 24 hours later, the thing had completely shifted. So that didn't always happen. But it's nice when it does, because many people have been praying for something for 25 years, 30 years, and nothing has changed. Now, we know the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different result. And so with prayer, we all but ignore that. The courts of heaven is simply another tool in the toolbox that we can use to get our prayers answered and get things done. Because if the other kinds of prayer are not working, then we maybe we need to consider, I'm, I need to use a different tool. I use the description that if I was to wanna to hang that picture on the wall in the living room, I better not be using a, a shovel to drive the nail in the wall. And my wife will not appreciate it, okay? Neither am I gonna use a handsaw. I'll use a hammer. So sometimes we've been using a shovel or a handsaw when we needed to use the hammer. And the courts of hammer, the courts of heaven may be that hammer that you've been needing to pick up instead of the shovel, hoping to get things moved. Uh, we've had uh, just in the last few days with the stuff that we do, uh, we have dealt with situations where people had been in bondage to something for all their life and could not get free. So we again deal with those false verdicts, get those things overturned, and replaced with a righteous verdict. And, uh, and sometimes a matter of minutes, but sometimes a matter of days, uh, they're, they're set free. They're not complaining. Oh, and some people say, oh, the courts of heaven is so hard. Not really. You've got a help desk, so do something. Uh, ask for help. You know, if I don't know, I'm going to ask for help. Okay, and I can do that. And they don't mind answering and supplying the help. Uh, and you'll find it quite in, uh, interesting as you step into the courts of heaven and engage the help desk. Sometimes the fun thing is that the, the angels that assist you at the help desk are often very chatty. They'll say, how's your day going? How are the kids doing? How's work? And things like that. Just chatting you up like you would somebody that knew you your whole life. Or they'll say, oh, we've been looking for you. We've been waiting for you. So uh, I encourage you to engage the courts of heaven. You know, step in and, and learn some things about that. Well, folks, um, I've been talking with Dr. R uh, Ron Horner. Uh, we've been zeroing in on this book, Overcoming Verdicts from the Courts of Hell. He also has this other book, which I happen to have, Engaging the Mercy Court of Heaven, and a number of others that you can find on his website at courtsofheaven.info, which is where I assume people can also get a hold of you. Right. Correct. Yes. Yes. Do you have any final thoughts before we conclude this program? Well, when people have prayers that have gone for a long time, mm. and they've not seen a move, chances are there's something that needs to be done legally in the courts of heaven to make that thing move. I talk about in that first book, Engaging the Mercy Court, about reasons why your prayers aren't answered. So if we can deal with the reason that's keeping that thing held back, get it set free, the answers will come guarantee uh, do they always come exactly the way we expect them 
not necessarily, but we don't always need it that way. Uh, but we need to know that there's another tool that we can use in our toolbox. It doesn't do away with the father-son kind of prayer or the friend-to-friend -friend kind of praying that I talk about in the Mercy Court book. It's simply another tool in the toolbox. Uh, a mutual friend of Dan and I, she refers to it as intercession on steroids. Okay, because she sees things, uh, situations that have taken her six months to a year to deal with are getting done in a matter of days or weeks or a very few few months, depends on what it was, uh, because we can get things dealt with. What are the legal things holding this thing down and get that thing set free and they can move on. So jump in and have fun in the courts of heaven. A lot of good things are going to come out of that. Change your life. It will really change your life. Well, it's already changing lives, Dr. Horner. So I just want to say thank you for taking the time to step on the program with me and have a chat. And uh, folks, until next time, God bless and God speak. You've been listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. If you would like to connect with us at Bride Ministries or to support what we are doing financially, visit us at www.bridemovement.com.